Hi, this is Michelle Medrano. I am so happy today to get a chance to talk to an upcoming speaker in our renowned speaker program. Mr. Dacker Keltner is with us. He is the author of this wonderful book I've been enjoying, Awe, uh, The Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. And I think he has a very powerful and transformative message. He's going to be with us at Mile High Church on Friday, November 1st. And so we're happy to get a chance to hear from him a little bit and get a sense of what he's going to be talking to us about. So welcome, Mr. Dacker Keltner. Is it all right if I call you Dacker? That's a Please. great name. That's an unusual, good? fun name. Thank you. My dad made it up. Oh, he did, huh? Yeah. Wonderful. That's great. Well, uh, thank you so much for your amazing work in the world. I know this isn't your first book, and uh, you're a wonderful instructor and teacher. I have loved the movies that you've gotten to um, consult on, The Inside Out. Is, that's the name of the, and I just saw the two number two recently. Very powerful, powerful movies for sure. And so uh, wonderful, wonderful work. And we also are choosing consciously to have you come and be with us at a time when we know people are uh, experiencing some anxiety possibly around uh, world events and around the election here in the U.S. and things like that. And so why don't we start there if you want. Um, sure. I just, I love your definition of awe, the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your current understanding of the world. Very very powerful. Can you give us some uh, words that would help us to apply that to the state we're in right now, especially as people are ang anxious about upcoming events? Yeah, you know, what a terrific way to open this up, Michelle, because you're you're speaking to really where we are as a culture, right? Which is, right. Uh, I think it's, you know, I'm an optimist and hopeful about human beings and our prospects, but we're in a time of crisis. We are in a time of loneliness crisis, of mental health crisis. Certain data suggests that uh, our health, physical health isn't as robust as it could be. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the crisis of cultural identity, of polarization and you know the us versus them divide. And then of course the climate crisis. And the reason I wrote this book is exactly to address your question, which is I was in a very hard period of my life, my younger brother had passed away and I was feeling these crises of, you know, physical disorientation and anxiety. And, and I'd been doing this science of awe, the feeling of encountering things that are vast and mysterious. And we'd been learning that it is about as good for you as anything that you could do, mm -hmm. anything. Uh, it is good for your heart, your immune system, your sense of self, your pro-sociality, your belief in being connected to things, your loneliness. And, and so I went, uh, I wrote the book to give people an idea of how to find more awe in their everyday lives. And, and that'll really be the, the point of our gathering together. Mm -hmm. Great. And and you've mentioned many of the benefits of that. I find it fascinating that um, sometimes people seem to want to cling to their pain like they're resistant yeah. they think this may be too simple of a of a solution what do you yeah. mean look for awe just feel awe how can that help but you're really talking about there are tremendous benefits and multiple layers and so why not at least give it a shot right yeah you know i too was skeptical right uh you think about some of the problems that people face in the united states of being a veteran and not feeling like you have a home anymore or, you mm -hmm. know, here in the U.S. or the, uh, an unhoused individual or somebody suffering sexism or traumatized people. Uh, and I became convinced not only of the science. Uh, we did a study, for example, allowing veterans and inner city under-resourced high school students go rafting for a day. And in the case of veterans, there's a 32 percent drop in PTSD, right, just by uh -huh. finding awe in nature. So I became convinced by the science that, yeah, the hardest problems we face, polarization, trauma, you know, loneliness, et cetera, can be met with daily doses of awe. And then I got convinced by the people, I tell a lot of stories in the book. Yes, uh, yes. You know, interviewed people, and, and they said the same thing. Stacey Bear, a veteran up in Michigan, was, you know, coming back from Iraq and just really struggling, and you found all that outdoors in Colorado, rock climbing. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some of the prisoners I've become friends with 
find awe in their time inside prisons and then feel committed to help young people avoid the lives that lead to prison. So I, I think it's up to the task of the hardest problems we face. I do too. And a, a number of the things that you list that, that are pathways or doorways into awe are big ones for me, music and the like. Yeah. And one of the greatest ones you just mentioned is what I remember from your book was reading stories of people who who are awesome, who give yeah. us some awe-inspired outcome, who show some extraordinary kindness or ability or make you just go, wow. Yeah. Reading and being present to those stories as a huge doorway into awe is really wonderful. So you've you've got some great stories in your book for sure. Thank you. And, and you know, I call that moral beauty. Yes. You know, an old philosophical tradition. We used to think a lot about the saints and role models and heroes who inspire us. And somehow we've lost touch with that for, mm. for interesting reasons. Um, and it, it was one of the big surprises in our research for 15 years, you know, was that the most common source of all around the world is just the people around you yes. and their courage and their kindness and how they overcome disease and poverty and bias and war, et cetera, just to do good in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and that feeling of awe through moral beauty is one of the most powerful things we need to cultivate right now. We live in a very, we live in a morally ugly time. Yes, we do. You know, when you think about the rhetoric you hear and the stuff you hear about online and 4chan, where people can say any nasty thing about a fellow human being, mm -hmm. we need to, we need to shift course, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think moral beauty, what, what we find, not only in the stories I tell, but also, um, and everybody else will tell, but also the science is that um, this is a moral compass for us that we need to rediscover. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. And you answered one of my questions, what surprised you most about your research? So thank you yeah. for, for answering that uh, for sure. And um, tell me uh, right now for you, as you're going along with us through this cultural experience, what are, what is bringing you into a, a state of awe these days? Well, you know, Michelle, uh, and I'll talk about this in the talk, and, and it's very important because 80% of people, the new literature su suggests, will encounter real trauma, you know, in their lives. They will have a loved one die too young, mm -hmm. like I did, my younger brother. They will be traumatized by violence or economic hardship, et cetera. And so that's just part of the human condition. And, and we do live in these stressful times, as we said. And what I found in the grief I felt for losing my companion and all my younger brothers, go find it everywhere, you know? And that was the other surprising finding of our science is what I call everyday awe. Mm -hmm. If you just pause and reflect and be receptive and not try to name or control things, uh, you can find a lot of awe and enjoy its benefits. And that's what I did. And that's what I do to the present day when I worry about politics or climate crises or, you know, my daughters, et cetera. You know, I, every day I stop and touch this redwood tree, you know, who that's is a, 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 a sibling of mine. And every day I look up into the sky and every day I try to see a little bit of moral beauty around me, just people mm -hmm. who are kind. Mm -hmm. And every day I think about, something, some big idea that really matters to me. I would say every other day, and I'll talk about this with you is, you know, I'll listen to a piece of music and even hum a little that, that brings me awe, right? Mm -hmm. And and coming out of those simple experiences, they don't cost a cent. Right. Something like, wow, I feel, I feel strong. I feel purposeful. And mm -hmm. then I try to give that, I try as hard as I can to give this away to fellow citizens and human beings. That's great. I think one of the things that strikes me, and I'd like to know your thoughts about this, and in the teaching that I'm a part of, the spiritual tradition I'm a part of, we we talk sometimes about a spiritual bypass and how we can use something to bypass our pain and the grief yeah. you felt losing your brother. I also lost my sister uh, right about the same time I think you lost your brother, and um, and the grief was deep and profound. But what I've been finding in reading what you've written and really practicing what you're talking about it's not awe or grief it's both and it feels to me like 
I can presence myself to my grief and feel it full out. And I can be present to awe at the same time. And that the two together help me attain a balance for living and walking forward and feeling it all completely. I'm not using awe as a bypass. Is that how you would describe it also? Totally. You know, the, the, the great wisdom traditions that you all learn about and study at Lakewood of, you know, the lessons of Jesus and embracing mm -hmm. the prostitute and the poor and the impoverished, and then the lessons of the Buddha, you know, mm -hmm. first noble truth is life has hardship and suffering and dying. Uh, and, and that's just fundamental to life. Mm -hmm. um, and what we know, and, and the awe literature is really illustrative of this, is that when humans face suffering and hardship and trauma, and like Stacy Bear, this veteran, like, God, what were we doing in Iraq? And why was he seeing people get blown up for that? Wow. Little kids, right? The mind gets to work and it, it thinks about the meaning of it and sees if it makes sense. And that's what awe does for us, is we know through science and then personal experience that when I feel awe during hardship, uh, I come up with new principles that I can live by. I come up with new practices that I can cultivate spirit in. I come up with new ways to give to the world, right? And, and that's the path to growth. Uh, mm -hmm. And it needs both. It needs the hardship. It needs the imagination and awe, and, and uh, that'll be part of our conversation. That's great. Um, what did you find in your research or what are, are your feelings about awe as it relates to technology today, such as social media? I mean, I know sometimes I can go on social media and I can find some cute video that makes me go, oh, or some, some quote that someone puts. I'm a big fan of Rumi and I love Hafiz. Yeah. I feel that sense of, oh, wow, that's great. But at the same time, technology can be a, a hole that takes you down into not awe. Yeah. <laughs> so what is Most your... of it, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I, I, we find, you know, we survey, we gather these stories of awe from 26 countries, people all over the world, and they never mention technology. You know, yes. they mention nature and moral beauty and spirituality and music and art, big ideas, life and death. And moving with other people and so forth. And so, you know, I think that's a fair assessment, which is that technology when used right can get you to awe. Somebody can text me something and say, man, your favorite musician is playing tonight. And I go, it's like, wow, yes. you know, like you nicely said, Michelle, someone could send me an idea like I didn't know. Um, you know, someone just sent me this, this article that David Hume, a very influential philosopher in my thinking, was influenced by Buddhism. I'm like, that's amazing. Wow. It's, it's not technology per se, it's the knowledge it delivers. And on balance, technology is not a friend of all. You know, mm -hmm. it, is a, it is more likely to produce envy, self-focus and, and rumination and self-criticism. And those are all antagonists to all. Yes, most definitely. Great, okay. Well, I guess my last question is, can you tell our listeners what will be some of the greatest benefits of joining us on November 1st? Yeah, you know, I'm going to tell several stories about all, you know, where does it come from culturally? What is its evolution? Uh, how do we put it into practice? How does it affect us personally? And I think that the, you know, I think what uh, the, the thing that I try to really leave people with is the sense that with three minutes every other day, they can mm -hmm. find everyday awe. Mm -hmm. And so we will do practices that encourage a sense of moral beauty and how to listen to music and how to just go out and pause in nature, uh, how to reflect on the whole cycle of life. And we'll do practices. And, and I have confidence that those who come will come away with a sense like, yeah, I can go build some on to my life without changing much and really feel stronger, feel more empowered, feel like I know the, the moral compass in where I'm supposed to go. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's what it, the science says, what it gave to me and what I hope to give to you guys. Wonderful. Well, I'm feeling pretty confident that we're all going to have a great experience <laughs> and it's going to be a wonderful respite from the culture wars and the election yeah. conversation yeah. and all that, a great chance for us to connect. So we look forward to having you with us November 1st, 7 p.m. at Mile High Church. You can be there in person and we're selling online tickets too if you want to catch us online if you're not local. So thanks so much, Dacker. It's been great to have this time with you. Me too. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. See you then. Bye-bye.